All right, well, we are in the middle of a series that is a bit ambitious, walking through, I don't know, the whole Bible, uh, from Genesis to Revelation. If you've been with us, we're 27, 28 weeks in. And, you know, part of the reason we're doing this is we wanted to train you in how to see the Bible. Um, I think a lot of us think about the Bible, and we think of kind of this picture that we're going to throw up here for you of just kind of these um, circles as, as stories. There's just kind of random stories uh, within the, the Bible. It's kind of a, a shotgun approach, right? Um, where, where, okay, this is cool. This is fun. It's a nice lesson, but there's really no connection, no big picture or story here. But what we've been trying to show you and kind of moving to the next slide is that it's telling a story, right? There's a movement to this. There is a progression to the whole thing. It's going somewhere. This isn't just scattered random stories. It's a fluid storyline. And these dots are connecting as, as the scriptures are really threaded together as one. And we've turned the page from part one, the Old Testament, into part two, the New Testament, with Jesus. And what do we see? That storyline just what? It just continues, Right? It just continues. It just keeps going. It, it, there's no disconnect in the story of the scriptures. Uh, I, I hope that this is kind of what the Bible is beginning to look like for you. Uh, as crazy as it is, like you're seeing that overarching thread. Now, now there's a deeper layer even than this. I, I hope that the Bible is also beginning to look like this. Throw up the last slide. Woo. You're like, oh my gosh, that's nauseating. Okay, just picture for a minute like a detective's investigation wall, right? And they've got all the strings going everywhere. That's the Bible. It's not just a storyline, it is, but there's also every ounce of these layers and strings connecting to each other, all interrelated. That is the Bible. And it's all culminating and crescendoing in the epicenter of it all, which is Jesus. Okay, this is the Bible. And maybe you're like, I, I, don't, I don't get that yet, okay? I don't see all, all of that. It's, it's a little more simple to me. Hey, the more you read, and I just encourage you, the more you begin to, to invest and meditate and study the Word of God, the more these things start popping out. Oh, that reminds me of this. And there's hyperlinks everywhere. And you begin to see that, that the one promised in Genesis 3.15 is Jesus, Right? And, and, and we saw Jesus then call the disciples and we're reminded of what? Of God calling the patriarchs and pursuing them in his covenant love. And, and, and we see Jesus caring for outcasts and we see Jesus beginning to do all these things in the New Testament. We go, wait a minute, that reminds me of this. He forgives sin. Oh, he's the true and better Joseph. Right? Oh, oh he... He goes under the waters of baptism and emerges and, and goes into the, the wilderness and overcomes temptation. He's the true and better Adam, right? And we begin to see all of this threading together. I hope that is what's happening. Last week, we saw Jesus calms the storm. He is the Prince of Peace. He's the one that stares into the storms around us and is able to still and silence them with a word. But even if he doesn't, he's able to still and silence what? Your soul with a word. Because he himself went under the waves of the cross for you and I. That is our Jesus. And as we read today, we're going to keep seeing this inexhaustible treasure that he is. And we're also going to see it, once again, thread together in the story. Um, well, have you ever received this notification on your phone before? If you have this? No, not that one. Is there another one with a notification? No? Well, you probably haven't then. That's great. Uh, my bad, I kind of sent it late. There, okay, well, that ruins that. All right. Have you ever seen a notification on your phone that says, storage full, you cannot take a photo, right? You ever been there in that moment? Oh, it's a terrible moment. And it's never like an ordinary moment where you're like, I don't know, taking a landscape still picture of a tree or something. It's like, no, championship game action moment. Oh, no, I can't, right? It always happens like that. And so what happens? Got to get more storage. Oh, Tyler, it's 2022. Just get the cloud, dude. Okay, I hear you. I hear you. But I'm a little old school. Number one, I, I care about every penny, so I can't stomach buying storage. And number two, I really like throwing things away and deleting things, okay? 
I'm an anti-hoarder with a passion, so I probably won't go that route. Uh, Now, many of you have already gone that route. Now, here's what's interesting about phones. I did a little research for you, and in my expertise with Excel sheets, I created a very impressive chart for you. Okay, now we can show that chart that you already saw. Okay, that chart is phone storage over the last 15 years, right? It's like, oh my gosh, it looks like COVID numbers or something. Yeah, exactly, right? The exponential increase of this thing. Like, I don't know if you remember, do you remember when four gigabytes was a lot? Yeah, me too. I'm like, I'll never need any more than that, right? Now it's like, ah, 512, gosh, right? We're at the terabyte now. That's where we're at. We seem to think we always need more. And we ask the question, will I ever have enough? What a word, enough. It's a real elusive word, isn't it? What's enough? Do I have it? And will I have it enough to make rent? Enough to buy a house? Enough to retire? Enough to take care of all my needs? Whatever that mysterious word even means. Do I have enough, and will I have enough energy? Will I have enough sleep, enough friends, enough vacation days, enough activities for my kids, enough shoes, some of you, right? Enough tools, enough toys, enough customers, enough horsepower, enough alone time. Introverts said amen amen to that, right? Enough followers. Are my grades enough, sales enough, reviews enough? Am I fit strong or attractive enough? Am I productive enough? It goes on and on, right? Am I dating enough? Am I drinking enough? Am I parenting enough? Am I forgiving enough, laughing enough, working out enough? The answer is always no. No to that. What's the level? At what point is enough enough, right? And when we get there, we think we arrive, we easily begin to see it's actually not. And the goal line keeps moving and we're not satisfied. How do we overcome this problem? How do we combat the pursuit of enough? Well, it's not consumerism, as I've hopefully shown you with my excellent charts up here, right? It's not just to get more and get more. You will not be satisfied. That's never going to meet your needs and fill you. Okay, well, what's the answer? Is it number two? Is it asceticism? Just to forsake all your desires. You rise above your needs by what? By killing your needs. By stopping being needy. Well, that's not the answer either. You were made and hardwired for these things, many of which are good. Oh, okay. Well, I see then if it's not to fast and it's not to feast, it's somewhere in the middle. You just got to diet, right? The answer is minimalism, okay? Just reduce all that crazy extra stuff and, and declutter your life, right? Like Marie, whatever her name is. I can't even remember. Is that what today is about? No, today's not about Marie, whatever her name is. Today's about the Bible, okay? The answer is actually none of those three. The scriptures are going to show us today there is a better way. Ah, okay. I see where you're going, Tyler. This is a a sermon on contentment today, just to be okay with what you have, to just adjust your attitude and your expectations. No, no, that's not what today's about. The gospel isn't about abandoning your needs. It is about satisfying them. It's not about settling for less. Quite the opposite. It's about receiving what you were always meant to have because Jesus isn't here to replace or reduce or regulate or remove Eden. He's here to recover it. So here we go. Matthew chapter 14. Let's look at what's going on. Verse 13. And when Jesus heard this, heard what? Well, he, he learned that King Herod had just decapitated his relative and good friend, John the Baptist. Pretty hard news. And when he heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself, or uh, the Greek also, to be alone, okay? To be alone. Jesus wants to retreat, right? Right? 
uh, he needs some space to be able to grieve and process, to get away from the crowd, get out of Herod's spotlight, and spend time with God the Father as he debriefs the death of his family member and forerunner. Matthew's clearly connecting these two. But in Mark and Luke, as we read this story today, it's the only miracle that is in all four Gospels. And in Mark and Luke, we're going to see that they highlight the reason to withdraw and get away as something different. It's actually the disciples who had just been, uh, been sent out and returned from um, some really encouraging and high energy ministry, and they needed to download what happened. But they couldn't do it all in the onslaught of ministry busyness. So look at Mark 6:30 30 through 31. The apostles returned to Jesus, and they told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, catch this, and they had no leisure what even to eat. Whew! All the moms in the room say amen to that, right? Did you like lock yourself in the pantry? No leisure even to eat, okay? That's how busy and crazy things were in ministry. And Jesus is saying, okay, boys, let's get away a little bit. When the, get out of the nonstop pace of life. As they hear the discouraging news about John the Baptist, the disciples are probably battling fear, and he needs to re-rally the troops and pull back from the demands to reflect and recharge. It's important, right? It's important for you and I to do the same. Uh, a few years back, we preached a whole sermon series, 15 weeks one summer on rest. 15 weeks. It's that important to have these rhythms of Sabbath in your life. Okay, so they hop in this boat and they head out of the city. But look at what happens still in verse 13. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. So they're so attracted to Jesus. They just see him out on the boat and they're like, oh, we're just going to go around the shore, right? And they follow him around as he's trying to get away so that when he comes to the place, they're already on the shore. Like, hi, Jesus. Right? Again, mom's in, in the pantry, open the door. Like, hi, mom. Right? Like, they're waiting. The needy people, the needs haven't gone away. They're still there. Imagine that for a moment. You're going on vacation and you're greeted with work. You ever been there? Ever, ever happened to you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, all the disciples in this moment want is what? It's rest. Can I just take a break? Can I just chill? Like Jesus is taking us to the, the Sandals Resort, right? Sea of Galilee style, and all we want is some time to get away. What do you do in that moment when you're <laughs> greeted with people, you're probably disappointed. You're probably irritated. You know, I, I don't know if they're like fake smiling as they see the crowd, <laughs> right? What do you do in the moment? Look at what Jesus does. It's astounding. Verse 14, when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he what? He had compassion on them and he healed their sick. Mark and Luke will say he, he taught them about the kingdom of God. He welcomes them in this moment. He begins to teach them and he begins to heal them. He doesn't sign a few scrolls for them and send his security team in to push them back, right? He doesn't reschedule them for next week when, it, when his agenda opens up a little bit. No, he receives them warmly. He steps into their need and he ministers to them. In all their neediness, Jesus doesn't reject them. He's not annoyed. He, he, what, he, he gives of himself to them. Like, uh, this is amazing. I don't know if you see how Jesus is viewing interruptions, but it's staggering. He views it with, what, compassion. I've taught him this word before in the Greek. Remember what it means? Splachna, right? Kind of sounds Klingon-ish. It's a Greek word, I promise. And it just means kind of what it sounds like to be stirred, to be turned in the inside, the deepest core of who you are, to be moved with emotion. That's the state of Jesus' heart as he sees this crowd. He sees them and he sees their story and he steps in with saving grace. The picture in Mark, he says that he was moved with compassion because he saw them as what? A sheep without a shepherd. Y'all, think about the imagery there. 
Jesus sees these people where you and I maybe see interruptions. Jesus sees harassed and helpless sheep that just need to be cared for. He's stirred on the inside. They, they were desperate. They were sick and needed healing. They were ignorant and needed teaching. They were harassed by demons and fears and worries. They needed help. And the God of Exodus 34, the one who's merciful and gracious, who's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, the God of Exodus 2 who hears the cries of his people and their suffering, who knows their pain and enters into it. And the God of Exodus 34 who's close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. That God is Jesus and he steps in. Amen. He's stirred in his guts with empathy for these image bearers. And so because of that, he pivots his plan. And he moves out of retreat mode into rescue mode. Because y'all, people to Jesus are not interruptions to his agenda. They are his agenda. You tracking with that? People are not interruptions to Jesus' agenda. They are his agenda. Like, this is important because some of you in this room, I know this about you. You view God like you're a bother to him. Like, like, you know, like you're walking on eggshells, like, okay, I'm, I know I asked for this last week, but God, if I can just maybe ask again, if, it, if, if it's okay, like, just please don't be annoyed. I, I know I'm still needy. I know I still haven't done the things that you want me to do, but please, he's not irritated by your need. I don't know what your earthly parents or earthly friends were like. Maybe they pushed you away when it was just a certain limit. He has no limit. He welcomes you. He's not annoyed by you. Some of you need to hear that and you need to believe that. See Jesus right here and his compassion for you and your need, y'all. So they have a plan. It, it gets prevented. Jesus pivots. Now, verse 15, let's see the problem that comes out of that. Now, when it was evening, the disciples came to Jesus and they said, uh, this is a desolate place, Jesus. The day's now over. Here's the plan. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves, right? Like, this is a remote place. There's no DoorDash. There's no Amazon drones hanging around, right? Like, it's getting that time, that, that kind of cutoff time. Send them away to go get some food, Jesus. And, and, and in some ways, this seems pretty kind by the disciples, right? Like, they're recognizing the problem. Now, now part of its kindness, part of its probably weariness, right? Like, hey, we're tapped out. Like, can we call it a night? Jesus, can we get that retreat, finally, that you promised? But some of it's just logistical. Like, what are we going to do here? <laughs> right? We need to do something. We need a plan. Here's Jesus' plan. You ready? But Jesus said, verse 16, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. <laughs> I love this, right? Uh, here's my plan. You're going to meet their need. You're going to solve the problem. Now, in the book of John... We get a little insight on this. Jesus said this in order to test them, okay? Like always, Jesus knows exactly what he's going to do. We saw this last week, right? The chess master at work, he's moved ahead. He knows what he's going to do. So he, he says this to test them. Now, the situation's pretty dicey. We learn that there's 5,000 men, which means there's probably somewhere between 15,000 and 20,000 people. Y'all, that's... That's a big crowd. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's where the Thunder play. Chesapeake Arena, what is it now? Devon, some, what is it called? Paycom, Paycom Palace? Okay, cool. <laughs> What's it going to be like next year? Sonic Center? I, some, some Oklahoma, but we just pass it around. I don't know what it is. It, it, that's the same amount of people. It's 18,000 capacity, okay? So you're going to feed that whole crowd. And he tells 12 guys, hey, you do it. You do it. We're out in the wilderness. We're out in the desert. You figure it out. So what do they do? They said to him, we only have five loaves and two fish. Just a few thousand short, Jesus. Right? Kind of feel the sarcasm there. They don't have what they need. In John, Philip goes into 
okay, well, maybe we could buy it mode. And he's crunching the numbers, right? And it's more than $30,000, 200 denarii, just to even give someone, everyone a bite, Jesus. We don't have that kind of funds in the account. Well, they can't buy it. They don't have it. They've run all their practical options. Jesus, you're asking us to do something that we can't possibly do. We can't. Ever told God that? God, you're asking me to obey you here, but I I can't. I I don't have the financial resources to to pull that off. I I can't go help that friend. I'm too exhausted. I, I can't keep staying patient with my kids. I do have a limit, right? I can't talk to my neighbors about you. I don't know what to say. I can't get up earlier. I can't make it to GC. I can't love that difficult person. I can't forgive them for what they did. I can't. Uh, Six years ago, when God called me to plant this church, that was my immediate response to him. I can't. Exactly what I said. Literally, it's what I said. I can't. And my mind began to race with all the logistical problems. Uh, where are you going to send us? Like, how are we going to pull this out? I don't have the financial means to make this happen. Who are you going to send with me? I can't do this alone. I'm not about to uproot my family, Jesus, and move to the middle of wherever, right? Like, uh, how, when, where, why? All those things began to flood my mind. I can't. I remember one of the things I even thought was, I, I can't preach every week. Like, I know how long it takes me to do this. Like, there's no way I could pull that off. Like, I'm not, I'm not the lead guy. God, that's not me. We say, when we see the needs in front of us, and we see our inability, we say we can't. Which is precisely the point. That's what Jesus wants to bring us to. That place of recognizing and admitting that there's no way not even close to have the ability to do that. I'm a few thousand loaves short, Jesus. And as I was six years ago in fear, spitting out those I can't, he just hushed my internal storm and he said to me, Tyler, I'll take care of all of that. I just want your yes. I just want your yes. See, we tend to forget there's another option, right? When we look we're very quick to see our deficiency, but we're very slow to see Jesus' sufficiency. We forget there's another option. Amen. The disciples have forgotten who's with them. Look at verse 18. And he said, Jesus said, bring them here to me, the, the loaves and fish, right? Just bring me your loaves. Give me what you got. I just want your yes. That's where the answer begins. Verse 19. Then he ordered the crowd to sit down on the grass in, in kind of 50s and 100s. So there would be aisles and this would be done orderly. This isn't going to be chaotic. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, what does he do? He looked up to heaven and he said a blessing. And then he broke the loaves. He, he takes, he blesses the food, he gives thanks to God and acknowledges him as the source of all this provision. He takes the food and then he breaks the food right in front of them. And he then gives, look at the result. Then he broke the loaves and he gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. Straight from the hands of Jesus here, you have, in the middle of the desert, a farm to table feast. (laughs) Just from Jesus, like, out of nowhere. And I don't know about you, but I've dwelled on how is he pulling this miracle off, right? Like, what's going on here? This seems extremely ordinary. He's not raining down bread from heaven. There's no earthquakes. There's no angels like flying by, dropping off loads here. There's no t-shirt cannons with bread loaves being fired out at the masses. How is Jesus pulling this off? You almost miss it. It's so ordinary. Look at it. He gave 
them to the disciples and they gave them to the crowd. The word in the Greek is an imperfect tense, meaning they continued to give. He continued to give to the disciples who continued to give to the crowd. So the disciples would go to the crowd, give their basket, empty it out, go back to Jesus, somehow find that his basket was not running out, get a refill, go back to the crowd, serve them, and repeat. And this was happening in an ongoing way. And in the miracle, Jesus' supply never runs out. They go out, they run out, they come back, and he has more. He's continually creating food. I don't know how exactly. Like, where did the fish come from, right? (laughs) That's pretty crazy, right? They weren't caught. They were what? They were created. (laughs) The only one who can do that is the same one of Genesis 1, who created in the beginning That's what we see Jesus doing, supernaturally multiplying what the disciples gave him. And by the way, that must have been some awesome bread, right? I kind of know what your favorite is, Texas Roadhouse Rolls. I'm partial to the cheese biscuits at Red Lobster, if you're into those. Yeah, okay, I got a fan. But whatever it was, I'm sure this tasted way better, right? Straight from the hands of Jesus, here's some bread. And he gave, and he gave, and he gave the inexhaustible supply. And what does it say? And they all ate and were, oh, I love this word, satisfied. They were satisfied. They had every single thing they needed. And we're going to see they even had leftovers, right? Not just enough, but more than enough. I love that. When you come to Jesus and he turns a Lunchable into Texas Day Brazil, you leave with leftovers, okay? Always more than what you ask for. Ephesians 3.20, our God is able to do far more abundantly than we ask or even imagine according to his power that is at work within us. You think he can meet your need? (laughs) Of course he can. He'll do more than even meet your need. Where is that ever-elusive enough satisfaction found? It's found in Jesus. And at the end, let's look at this. What do the disciples have? And they took up how many baskets? Twelve. Full of what? Broken pieces left over. Imagine that. Here they are, stunned, standing there holding a basket full of what? Broken pieces. (laughs) Jesus is showing them who they are as they see their own brokenness. And yet, at the same time, seeing their insufficiency right here in this basket, they're what? They're also provided for. Jesus gave them what they need. Jesus doesn't leave his boys hanging. He feeds them too. As you give yourself away for the name of Jesus, you will find that he'll take care of all your needs. Over and over, I have learned if you minister the gospel, as you minister the gospel, it ministers to you. As you pour yourself out, Jesus pours himself into you and you leave filled. So let me, let me just kind of bring us together here with some principles from this passage. There's really three main character sets, and I want you to see, okay, where am I at today? First is the needy crowd, right? Where are you like the needy crowd? We love to say here at the well, it's okay to not be okay. I'm going to say it a little different today. I'm going to say it's okay to be needy. Is there any other type of person? Like you are by definition needy. You are created, not creator. You lack. You need. We go, man, I'm, I'm in a pretty good place right now. I don't feel like I, I, I need anything. Well, praise God for that. Let's celebrate that first of all. But let's not forget that every breath you are taking right now, every neuron firing in your brain, every muscle moving or organ functioning correctly is being sustained by the very word of Jesus in you. And every dollar you have and every asset you own and every job you hold and every meal you eat and every friend you have is graciously been given to you by God and can all vanish in an hour. 
So just because you aren't aware of your needs does not mean you don't have a plethora of them. You are needy. You're needy. We, we preached this Sermon on the Mount a few weeks ago, right? We can't free solo our way to God. Like our awesomeness didn't, didn't get us in right relationship with God and our awesomeness won't keep us in right relationship with God. You don't stay in his presence by you. No, every single day we come to him with our needs. You have sin that needs rescuing. You have weakness that needs strengthening. You have wounds that need healing. You have attacks that need protecting and fears that need eliminating and habits that need maintaining. People that need loving Y'all, until Christ returns, until he ushers us into glory, you and I will be needy. So listen, hear me. Many of you are afraid to be needy. You hide your needs. You feel shame for being needy. Stop it. (laughs) You are needy. I am needy. Let's be like children like we heard a few weeks ago and be expert receivers. Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are what? Blessed are the poor in spirit for they shall receive the kingdom of heaven. So if we go back to the beginning, the answer is not to minimize your needs, it's not to ignore your needs, and it's not to chase the empty wells of the world to try to fill those needs. It's to run around the coastline and meet Jesus with those needs. Because he will always come on shore with compassion. Yeah, he could have turned the boat around, right? <laughs> He will always move towards you with his tender mercy, with his gut-stirring empathy for you. And he has total authority to meet your need, right? There isn't a need that he cannot meet. Matthew 5, 5, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Hunger and thirst for what? For righteousness. So this crowd, they didn't come to Jesus for bread, Right? No one said in the morning, hey, I, I'm going to head out into this desolate area because I'm hoping that Jesus is going to give me a meal tonight. Like, no. They went for what? For teaching, for healing. They went to meet him. Bread was the byproduct. They went for him. So here's the question. In what ways are you like the needy crowd? Are, Are you okay with being needy or are you fighting against it? If you're fighting against it, why? Are you seeking Jesus then with your needs or are you taking them elsewhere? These are questions you need to wrestle with. But there's not just a needy crowd. Number two, there's what? There's insufficient disciples because God wants to feed people through you. Remember, when he calls his disciples, he's going to make you fishers of Men, like you and I, if you are a follower of Jesus, are called up into meeting the needs of others also. That as he meets our needs, we're then free to go meet others. So what ways are you like the insufficient disciples? And what lessons do you need to learn from this passage about ministering to other people? I think there's several lessons, and I'm going to kind of give them very succinctly to you. Lesson number one, stop viewing people as interruptions, right? We've covered that. It's easy to look at coworkers and neighbors and children and parents and friends at times when they are needy and we just want fill in the blank, rest, escape, whatever it is, and to kind of avoid and withdraw from their needs, but they're not the obstacles. They're the goal. I I just want rest, Tyler, yes, and he will give it, not by you avoiding who he's entrusted to you, but by you stepping in to serve who he's entrusted to you. So here's the deal. Are you you viewing people as interruptions to your life? Or are you viewing them as invitations into their life? Number two, lesson two, recognize our insufficiency, right? I can't. That's okay. And that's good to say because it's accurate and true. There's a massive chasm between what you possess and what you need to meet their need, okay? That's okay. Let's embrace that because you're not the Messiah and you're not the fixer. That's okay. Um, I think in this passage, it's important to see that crowd's not just the needy one. The disciples are needy too. Right? And Jesus is meeting everybody's need in this story. 
Lesson three, give what we have. Bring your meager, pathetic offering, okay? (laughs) Don't be embarrassed of your loaves and fish. Just bring it. Bring your weariness. Bring your weakness. I, I hear people sometimes say, well, if I just had enough skills or enough resources and finances, enough time, then I would step into this. No, because enough is elusive and you probably wouldn't. It's going to change. You, you, you enter in now with what little you have and he multiplies it. Um, you know, right now in our church, the Lord's moving in some... Um, just some sweet and exciting ways. Every Sunday, I'm just hearing story after story of how the Lord is meeting people. And it's not because we're wowing you with, you know, fog machines and lights and um, amazing advertisements on Instagram or anything like that. None of you are coming for that, right? <laughs> we don't even have a building, all right? Uh, we, don't, we don't even have signage out front, for crying out loud. I think most people just come here to play basketball, and they don't even know that we exist, right? So you're not coming for any of those things. We're, a, we're in a desolate place. We're out in the wilderness. You're just coming to meet Jesus, and guess what? He's feeding you. It's not because we're bringing anything. He's just multiplying what little we have. Let's keep embracing that inability and lack of resources as a church, and let's keep watching him. Lesson four, do the next thing. So Jesus told the disciples to have everyone sit down in these rows and and kind of squares and kind of order things. At that point, they didn't know what was about to happen. He didn't download the full plan, right? He just said step one, do the next thing. Be obedient to him in what's next, okay? He'll take care of the ensuing steps. Lesson five, ask him to provide what we lack. So the, the God who tells you to feed them will be the God who gives you what you need to feed them. Okay? This is a ministry principle over and over. What you need for them, you get from him. What you need from them, the needy, demanding people, which is all of us, in your life, what you need for them, you get from him. Ask him to provide what we lack. And then lesson six, go back to him over and over and over. You're going to need him again tomorrow. Great. He gave you what you need today. Awesome. Same story in the morning. Go back to him because you cannot graduate past needing him. Oh, how we want to do that, right? When I'm mature, when I've walked with Jesus long enough, when I'm in leadership, when I'm serving here, when I finally learned this lesson, then I won't be so needy. Uh Uh-uh. Then you're just more aware of your needs and you're taking your needs to Jesus more frequently. That's maturity. You don't graduate past needing him. You just regularly learn to go back to the source, okay? Lesson seven. Trust him to meet your needs in the process. This is Philippians 4.19. My God will meet all your needs according to what his riches in Christ Jesus. He'll give leftovers and satisfy you because what you need, I know this is cheesy, okay? If you're new to the well, I like cheesy things, okay? I like little sayings that are gonna stick in your mind and be like, man, that was really dumb. I don't care. I don't care. You remember them. What you need for them, you get from him. What you need for you will be there too. Hmm, that's cute. You can go tweet that. <laughs> Colossians 1.29, for this I toil, what, struggling with all my energy? No, with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. As I pour myself out, he will pour himself in to me. Uh, last Sunday, um, my, my Sundays, by the way, I don't know if you have a day of the week like this, but Sundays, I go home. People are like, oh, did you watch the, the game? You know, did you watch the NFL game? Did you watch the Super Bowl? I was like, no, I was passed out. Like, 3 p.m., I'm like, I'm horizontal, man. I'm, I'm done. Um, I, I'm just tanked after Saturday night and Sunday morning, right? And so last week, I uh, went to go pray with a brother in the church. And it's a good thing Terrell was with me in the car because my eyes were, like, you know, dozing all the way over there. And I'm thinking, okay, hour or two, pray, like, get home, rest, whatever. Seven hours later, okay, the Lord was doing some awesome things. And it was intense, okay? And so when I got home at 10 p.m., you better believe I was physically exhausted. But what? Strangely, in this weird paradox, this is what the Lord does, right? I was super energized, 
I was spiritually refreshed. So honestly, like I just got up from an amazing spiritual nap. I was like, let's go. Like, what's next, right? Lauren's like, chill out, go to bed, right? <laughs> this is what the Lord does, man. As you, as you pour yourself out, he mathematic. it doesn't make sense mathematically. He pours himself into you. All right, well, there's a third character in the story. He is the hero. And as we begin to get ready to worship here, we got to see that there is one who is satisfying not just our immediate needs, but our deepest needs. John 6, we got to end here seeing that what happened that day out on the plain was a sign. Now, it says this in John that that miracle was a sign. When it says that something is a sign, a sign does what? A sign points to something else. This feeding with bread was pointing to something else. Let's pick up the conversation. John 6, 26 through 27. Jesus answered the crowd, Truly I say to you, you're seeking me, not because you saw signs. This is the next day, by the way. They keep chasing him. You're seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. You just want some more bread. <laughs> okay? Verse 27, but don't labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Ah, okay, there's something more going on. Fast forward, chapter, or still chapter 6, verse 32. Look at what Jesus says next. Jesus then said to them, truly I say to you, it wasn't Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Okay, Jesus, if you're new, is tying it back to the wilderness. Remember the Old Testament? We did this last fall. And God miraculously feeding the Israelites with manna. Okay? He's raining down this supernatural bread he created for them every day. And in the morning, they get up and they have a choice. They can go gather what they need for that day, get up the next day, do it again, right? And he does this, by the way, for 40 years. Like, you think it's bad eating Mexican three days in a row? 40 years. But he provides. And the whole point is what? God is saying, I'm your sustenance. I'm your portion. Y'all remember this from the Old Testament? It's what? I made you. Remember this? Come on, you got it. I made you. I chose you. I saved you. I want relationship with you. What did he teach us in the wilderness? I'm all you need. I'm all you need. Which, by the way, the first verse in this passage, when they went to a desolate place, you know what that word desolate is? It's wilderness. Same word. I'm all you need. Okay. What do the people say? Jesus. That sounds awesome. Verse 34. Give us this bread always. I want bread that never runs out, right? Verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. I'm the bread who... Whoever comes to me will not hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. I said to you that you've seen me and yet do not believe. I am the bread. Jesus didn't just come to give us bread. He came to be our bread. He is our portion. He is the one who is satisfying. He's after more than just filling our stomachs. He wants to fill your soul with your deepest needs for acceptance and love and identity and forgiveness and transformation and peace. This is why he has come. Far more than just to meet your immediate need for today. He's come to feed you forever and he's done it on the cross. The verbs in this passage, all four passages, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, have the same verbs. He took, he looked up, he gave thanks, he broke, and he distributed. Jesus is going to do the exact same thing the night that he was betrayed before the cross. He's going to take, he's going to look up and give thanks, he's going to break, and he's going to distribute. And he's going to say, this bread is my body. The feeding of the crowd is a sign pointing to his own body being broken in a one-time event that he will keep then distributing the life-giving blessing of 
over and over and over and over. Amen. This is what Jesus is doing, is he not? He's recovering Eden. And so as the band comes up, we get ready to sing. We've got to see that there's no more seeking when you find it all. That's one of the songs we sing, right? It's one of the songs our band wrote. There's no more seeking when you find it all. Maybe today is the first day that you have ever sought Jesus. Maybe today's the day you finally find satisfaction in him. Maybe you've been running a lot of other places to try to find enough. Like the invitation's on the table today, y'all. Jesus is saying, come to me. If you're weary, if you're heavy laden, if you're empty and unsatisfied from the things of the world, if you're in the pigsty because you just exhausted all of your resources, come to me. I'm all you need. And I love in this passage as we see something that is so core to who we are at the well, and that is this, that God himself is the gospel. He doesn't just give us good things. He is the good thing. Y'all tracking with that? So many times we, we're focused on the bread, not the giver, right? We want something from God rather than recognizing the greatest gift is him himself. John Piper says it this way, Christ did not die to forgive sinners who go on treasuring anything above seeing and savoring God. And people who would be happy in heaven if Christ weren't there. The gospel is not a way to get people to heaven. It's a way to get people to God. It's a way of overcoming every obstacle to everlasting joy in God. And so if we don't want Jesus above all things, then maybe we haven't been converted yet by the gospel. Oh, Jesus, would you help us want you? Would you be our bread? Whether I get these tangible things or not, I get you. So what are the biggest needs that you see you have right now at church? Are you looking to Jesus to satisfy them? Or are you more focused on the bread? I want you to close your eyes, and I'm going to read one of my favorite passages of scripture over you. Hear the invitation of the compassionate one to you today. Isaiah 55. Come, everyone who thirsts. Come to the waters. You who have no money, come and buy and eat. Come, buy wine and buy milk without money, without price. It doesn't cost anything. Why do you spend your money for that which isn't bread? Why do you labor and work for the things that won't satisfy you? No, listen diligently to me. Eat what is good. Delight yourselves in rich food. Would you turn your ear, incline your ear, and come to me that your soul may live? Oh, God, we hear that invitation today. We thank you that you have the very words of life. You are life. And we spin our wheels so often on the things of this world that do not satisfy, and yet all along our soul is crying out for you. You're the bread, Jesus, that has come down from heaven. Thank you. Thank you for breaking, for dying in our place to extend and distribute and give yourself over and over and over and over to us that we might come back needy and eager yet again with our meager little offerings that you might multiply them and satisfy us to our deep core. Thank you. Keep changing our desires, God. Shift our focus, recalibrate us off of the bread and on to you. You are our portion. We sing now to you. Would you satisfy us as we do? Amen.